Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown of the Book of Boba Fett, episode seven, the finale in the name of honor. As this mixed bag of a season with very high highs comes to a close, I'm gonna explain all the subtle details that you might have missed in this finale episode, some really great Star Wars Easter eggs, just some awesome cinematic details that are easy to overlook, and really what the actual book of the Book of Boba Fett really was. Because I'll tell you, there's actually several things about that book that you might not know just by looking at it. Also, you can join us as we chat about this stuff live in Chicago, a live event we're doing tomorrow, 8 p.m. in Talia Hall. If you live in the Chicago area, you gotta come check this out. We're doing this with Rooster Teeth's Very Normal Podcast Tour. Ticket link in the description. Also, by the way, you can get your hands on this great Boba Fett inspired shirt at newrockstarsmerch.com, where when you get one, you can write in a custom shout out for our Star Wars after shows. So this episode opens in the city of Mos Espa, long shadow cast over it after the tragic bombing of Garth of Whip's sanctuary. Odd VFX detail I caught. That tall tower at the heart of the town now sits beside this large dome structure, whereas the establishing shot back in episode one placed that building a few blocks away. Uh -huh. But in the bottom right corner, you can see those red canopies hanging in the street. That's actually the street that leads to Garce's club, where down in the street level shots, you can see those same red canopies leading up to it. Inside, Boba says, Even if we win, there might not be anything left of the city. That really is Boba's ultimate concern. Like that Chicago diner bombing from Brian De Palma's The Untouchables that inspired this attack last episode, is it really worth engaging in this kind of urban warfare if it destroys the city or trying to save? This season we saw a similar fate befall Mandalore. The Empire bombed it so no one could have it. It's also been suggested this to be the backstory of Tatooine, which used to be a lush landscape. And after Boba learned how the Tuscans inherited this inhospitable terrain, it's now his priority to preserve any scrap of civilization this planet has left. Mando says they have the support of Freetown if they end the spice trade, which Finnick objects to, saying keeping the Hut's spice lines would maintain the status quo and give them some money. There's a lot of credits to be made from that orange powder. Now, spice is mined and manufactured on Kessel. We saw that in Solo Star Wars Story. But now we're seeing how it's shipped and distributed on Tatooine, where gangsters like Jabba the Hutt and the Pikes sell it to dealers all in this one hub. And as we've seen this season, those shipments result in these violent train lines that kill Banthas and Tuscans, sales that interrupt moisture harvesting, all preventing Tatooine from truly prospering and growing. Spice is killing our people. So, therefore, true change requires Spice to just be banned from this planet, or maybe just take Cobb Vance's hamster name approach and legalize it, tax it, raise some public revenue to build some gaffy tree parks, you know? Cad Bane struts up through Maz Eisley, passing these two Jawas stripping parts off a speeder. These actually are probably the same two Jawas who lifted Pike Tech for Pelimoto's shop. And he meets with the Pike leader and Mayor Makshais. I have to respond. I have to respond in some way. Now the mayor is voiced by director Robert Rodriguez himself, who also voices the Trandoshan leader at the end of the episode. And as an Ithorian, he speaks through these orifices on the side of his head, translated through a transmitter at the top of his head. I just love it in Star Wars where all the characters in the scene are all non-human faces. Now the Pike leader, voiced by Phil Lamar, confirms that it was the Pikes, not the Nikto Speeder gang who killed the Tuscans. We left evidence behind to encourage such a conclusion. They were charging us protection. We have to protect our margins. So as we suspected, it was the Pikes who painted that Nikto gang symbol on the Tuscan tents, meaning that Boba, by violently killing those Niktos for the Pikes, has really been playing the Pikes game this whole time. The whole time? Cad Bane is surprised. I didn't realize the Pikes syndicate was so ruthless. Cad Bane later even tells Boba what the Pikes did, taking that advantage away from them and really stripping this game down to just a personal matter between the gunslingers, which is really how Cad prefers to do business. Yet his refusal to play this game and his insistence on facing Boba even when the pikes were routed really results on Cad not making it out of this episode on his two feet. You gotta play the game. Cad says, That all depends on how much your two stomachs can bear. Yes, Ithorians have their two mouths, which lead to two stomachs. They also have four throats. R2-D2 pilots Luke's X-Wing to Maz Eisley, where Peli Moto's pit droids awaken, two first who kick the other awake. On the screen, the Oribesh translates to X-Wing. BD-1 watches in anticipation as a gonk droid passes along with the R5 astromech droid and the Treadwell droid, and Peli tells them, Hide that, get rid of that. Officer! Hi, officer! Ha, I thought of 
for my new Republic certification seal just as you were landing. Yeah, she tells her droids to cover all those stolen goods and notice how that pit droid's tarp just slips right off the crate anyway. And then the pit droid just kind of leans against the crate all casual like, nothing to see here. Now, Peli assumes this is one of the other new Republic officers that we've seen in X-Wings before, but this X-Wing does not have the markings that we saw on Captain Carson Tiva's X-Wing back in Mandalorian season two, but rather this is Luke's X-Wing from the original trilogy, later appearing in The Last Jedi in The Rise of Skywalker, and of course in the Mandalorian season two finale. Yet Luke is not piloting this. He left R2 and Grogu to travel alone, perhaps thinking that it's best for Grogu to just cut off his Jedi ties immediately. Did they teach you how to fly an X-Wing already? I know an astromech flew the ship. <laughs> like R5 did in episode 5, her droids always correct her when she suggests they might be extraneous and unnecessary. Now, R2 did pilot ships by himself in the past, like he flew Mace Windu Starfighter in Clone Wars alone. And other astromech droids have done this. In Revenge of the Sith, Obi-Wan had R7 pilot his Starfighter back to the Republic ship so that he could trick General Grievous and thinking he left Utapa just so he could get the best ever drop on them. Hello there. Pelly greets Grogu. Let me say hello to my old pal. Well, hello, bright eyes. Yeah, it looks like Grogu vocalized a little response there. The kid's starting to talk, folks. And she calls him Bright Eyes, the nickname for Charlton Heston's character in Planet of the Apes. Yet Pelly hates his real name. Grogu? Whoa, that's a terrible name. Sorry about that, pal. No way am I calling you that. Yes, giving voice to all the people who still call him Baby Yoda. Pelly feeds him some dung worms, stinky worms that are sold as food on Tatooine, first seen in the Phantom Menace video game. And when Grogu eats one, he does a little head bobble. Ba -da -ba -ba -ba. He's loving it. Back in Mos Espa, the mods ride past the Gamorreans at the Clutunian controlled spaceport and then past Black Hersantin in the Trandoshan controlled city center. You'll notice two Trandoshans passed right by him with a container showing how these Trandoshans are actually secretly setting up their surprise attack. Similarly, a few Aqualists clock the mods as they pass in the workers district, another craning his head around the door as they park, all of these gotras waiting for their moment. And despite these airtight defenses, the slow moving Cad Bane just walks right up. A red flag that their defenses actually ain't worth shit. Like he's not even sneaking. He's standing in the middle of the street. I love how he always struts like a Western gunslinger. He was actually initially inspired by Lee Van Cleef's angel eyes in The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Cad says, If that's not the quack to call in the stifling slimy. Which is a call back to Boba Fett saying this to Casca Reeves in The Mandalorian. I didn't know sidekicks were allowed to talk. <laughs> All of that isn't the quite calling the stifling slimy. Telling us there was a shared past history between Cad and Boba where they had this kind of shorthand, probably came from Django too. In Dave Filoni's unfinished Clone Wars season six arc, Boba and Cad actually dueled, resulting in that famous dent in Boba's helmet. Throughout this episode, they do hint at knowing each other when they were both younger. Don't toy with me. I'm not a little boy any longer, and you are an old man. When Cad reveals he beat Cobb Vanth, the camera pushes in on Boba, followed by this new angle on Cad that bathes him in blinding sunlight and dust, just showing Boba's sudden disorientation and viewing Cad now as a more serious threat. The Aqualicia, Trandoshans, and the Clutunians completely unsurprisingly betray Team Boba. These Clutunians initially appear on the other side of these passing train cars, just like that shot in Once Upon a Time in the West, and these poor Gamorreans don't make it. Fennec saves the mods. Thank you. Manners. I like it. You're welcome. Remember, Fennec also got mod enhancements from that same mod artist, making her technically part of the same class as the rest of them. The Pikes arrive, led by this unmasked Pike soldier. One of the rare times in live action a Pike has presented himself in public without a mask, showing how this badass is not afraid of these atmospheric conditions. Mando refuses to abandon Boba. It's against the creed. Really buy into that bent of photo. I do. So despite the armorer shunning Mando, he is still a true believer in the creed of no Mando left behind, as Paz Vizsla put his life at risk to save him on Navarro. He quotes the episode's title, We'll both die in the name of honor. You sure you wanna stay? This is the way. And since Mando at this point believes Grogu has chosen a life with the Jedi, he has no reason to preserve his own life in the name of anything else. The Major Domo butts in, I was educated on Coruscant. Not that that makes me better in any way. Get to it. I attended finishing academy. My parents were not wealthy by any means. I specialized in civic council negotiations. So it sounds like this major domo essentially got a degree in the same kind of Robert's Rules of Order that Senator turned Chancellor Palpatine used to corrupt and destroy the Senate on Coruscant. So not helpful here, but he tells the Pikes. 
Someday I hope to see the fabled obsidian cliffs of Obadiah with my own eyes. Yes, Obadiah is the Pike home world, and obsidian is a rare stone in the Star Wars universe used by Vader to build his fortress on Mustafar, and obsidian can actually be found in some red kyber crystals infused with the dark side of the Force. Now, the Major Domo's tablet that Bobo wrote all this down on is actually a 1970s Coleco Bolatronic game. I love it when they make props out of toys like that. And from this, he reads Boba's offer. I, Boba Fett, speaking as daimyo of the Tatooine territories, formerly held by Jabba the Hutt, do present the following offer. Nothing. Yes, a very generous offer, evoking Michael Corleone's offer in The Godfather Part Two. My offer is this. Nothing. Now, this handwritten note by Boba is, I believe, the book of Boba Fett, of this show's title. Because not only is it the one thing written by Boba Fett anywhere in this series, it actually includes some poetry and allusions to myth. If you refuse these terms, <clears throat> the arid sands of Tatooine will once again flourish with flowered fields fertilized with the bodies of your dead. Yes. Flourish with flowered fields fertilized. That's poetic alliteration, folks. And he's citing the fabled history told to him by the Tuscans about Tatooine as a planet once being lush, covered in water and vegetation. And the Major Domo tags it with his words. Yeah, a joke. Probably because you don't work and you're lazy. Oh, his words. But also feels like the way Bible readings at church services end with the word of the Lord. Because this is Boba preaching his vision for this planet free from the pain of spice, restored to the life-bearing gaffy trees and ripe fruits that they actually enjoy in the final scene. But really, you could argue this is just written to be super wordy so that both of them can surprise us all on their jetpacks. Bobo once again uses his knee missile that he used on Tython in The Mandalorian last season. He actually pulls the same move later, lifting his knee and firing his blaster at the same time, striking my favorite pose ever. Mando releases his old whistling birds, but they realize they are outgunned. They both actually have to repeat repeatedly blast one sniper behind them, definitely a redundant effort that leaves them exposed. Also, the slow motion shot of shooting the guy as he falls in the air definitely seems like Robert Rodriguez making a nod to his own shot in Desperado. Now, Boba Fett has clearly been building his squad all season long, sparing no expense. And if you want to build your own squad of Star Wars collectibles, our friends at Whatnot are here to help. Whatnot is a live video shopping app. Think a Star Wars hologram communication meets online auction. Yes, right on your phone, a collectible Collectibles expert will be live on screen chatting with the community and selling cool collectibles. Find the best Funko Pops, action figurines, comics, maybe even a lightsaber or two on the Whatnot app. Yes, I've been using it to go crazy on Mandalorian and Star Wars themed Funkos. I even got this one with Mando with Grogu on a Bantha. I really just got it for the Bantha. I love these things. Whatnot brings together a community of fans built around the things you love. Hop into a Star Wars auction and chat with other fans meet knowledgeable collectors, maybe even discover an unexpected gem. Oh no. Oh no! And you know what? It's not just Star Wars memorabilia. There are auctions for comics, sports cards, action figures, and all the cool stuff you'd like to have lining your walls. Most of these auctions start at just $1, so you can be sure to find a deal. There's even an occasional celebrity guest cameo and fun giveaways. So download Whatnot today using the link in this video's description to get $10 off your first purchase. And just like I found Ahsoka here, maybe you'll even find a Funko Pop of Din Djarin. But thankfully, the Freetown Weekway bartender played by W. Earl Brown, Timothy Oliphant's co-star from Deadwood. We now learn his name is Tanti. He pilots a V-35 speeder as backup. This model was actually created for the 1997 special edition of A New Hope, but the Pikes unleashed Scorpion Egg droids. These Scorpion-inspired droids were originally concept art designed for Attack of the Clones, but they have since been adopted as part of Star Wars history, dating back to the Clone Wars. They are meant to be larger versions of the droidicos from Phantom Menace, thus their same particle energy shields. This is their first live action appearance. And I love how here you can see how the Lucasfilm team designed their appendages to be curved and segmented like the barbed tail of a scorpion. Boba uses his targeting system. Yeah, that sound effect was the same sound effect used during the trench run in A New Hope. After Mando's Darksaber fails to penetrate those shields, he says, Our energy weapons can't get through and our kinetic weapons have too much velocity. 
Now later we can see how larger creatures like Black Kersantan and the Rancor are just able to break through barely by applying greater force more slowly. Like you can see how BK's knuckles just begin to break through. This slow shield penetration reminds us of the Holtzman shield generators of Dune, one of many things Star Wars ripped off from Dune. Those shield generators also require slow moving blades to penetrate. Blasters don't work, or they do, but like boom to penetrate these shields. If only they had Saw Gerrera here to teach him to roll grenades under the shields like he taught us to do in Clone Wars. Before Skad's super necessary twirl, you can actually hear Pike yell at them. <laughs> yes, Slimo, the Huttese profanity translating to slime ball. She's screwing dope hot, Slimo. Pelly and her pit droids arrive in a rickshaw pulled by an RIC droid. Anakin and Padme actually rode one of these and attacked the clones. As that Scorbinek rounds the corner, one pit droid just grabs his knees and trembles. I bet that's the sleepy one from earlier. Drash tells the Freetowners, I grew up at Womp Pop from here. Yes, referring to Womp Rats, which Luke Skywalker also uses as a measuring stick. Womp Rat for scale. But it's not impossible. I used to bullseye Womp Rats in my T-16 back home. They're not much bigger than two meters. Grogu, having chosen the best guard chainmail, reunites with Mando. Hey, what are you doing here? Oh, okay, little guy. I'm happy to see you too. Yes, he force leaps into Mando's arms, showing how he did learn some skills from Master Luke. Except now, his application of the force is in service of love. This is his way. Grogu even reaches out his little hand to the edge of Mando's helmet as if trying to caress his face, maybe even to lift his helmet off, just like he did the last moment they saw each other. Pelly says, The Force works in mysterious ways. Another example of how the Force is often considered a divine concept, God works in mysterious ways. Similar descriptions have been used by Yoda in comics and in the Legends novel Darth Plagueis by James Lucerno. The rickshaw crashes, Mando has a jetpack to catch Grogu, the pit droids just clamp up to reduce the impact, but poor Pelly lands face first, spitting out a tooth. Boba's rancor arrives. I love his gradual appearance just peeking out over those rooftops at first, evoking the way Godzilla is often showed fins first over the buildings in the Toho films. The rancor lowers its head, revealing Boba riding it in a saddle with stirrups, recalling Boba Fett's first ever appearance in the Star Wars Holiday Special. Grogu uses the force to yank out of the Scorpionek a ball joint. This little kid always just wants some ball-shaped parts for toys. But I love how it doesn't hurt him because he is wearing that chainmail. You can actually hear the clink when it hits him. The Rancor is able to overwhelm that first Scorpionek, and Boba orders, do it. Yes, killing the opponent by uncrossing the arms, severing it, kind of like how Anakin did to Dooku when he was given the same order. Do it. And then onto the second Scorpionek, the Rancor grabs its blasters, coming face to face with its red photoreceptor eye, giving that Rancor a target to focus on. And then so after using the severed limb to block that blast, it digs its thumb into its eye. During all this, Pelly meets the Major Domo. I am not a threat. Nice head tails. Uh, Come on, get behind me, pretty face. Pelly's got you covered. Yes, Amy Sedaris and Dave Pasquazi both performed at Chicago's Second City Theater around when Jon Favreau trained in the city's comedy scene. These two have co-starred on Strangers with Candy and on Sedaris's crazy true TV show. What kind of knife are you using, Tony? The kind with the serial numbers filed off. I like to call her daddy's girl. Little detail I love here. A pike tries to hide behind a column from the Rancor, but that Rancor just smashes through the column to grab him, leading to this. <laughs> I love that teamwork. You killed this one, Daddy! And then, yeah, you probably heard a Wilhelm scream edited in there. Cad Bane spooks the Rancor with his flamethrower, and then he asks Boba. One thing I can't figure, what's your angle? This is my city. These are my people. I will not abandon them. Yeah, Cad is asking the question we all have. Like, why does Boba feel such a loyalty to this city? Filled with water brokers who hate his guts. I think his Gaffy Tree quest left him with a deep connection to the Sands of Tatooine, which is now his new homeland, in which he links the Dune Sea with the crashing waves of Kamino. Bobo was rebirthed from the Sarlacc, he was rebirthed from the tree roots, and now he feels bound to protect this land. But despite his age, Cad is 71 here. He wins the quick draw on Boba twice. But you've got your father's blood pumping through your veins. This isn't the first time I beat you out on a job. I would love to see their full backstory at some point. Hopefully Cad survived, or maybe we might see it earlier in the timeline. Like they were both around during the timeline of Obi-Wan Kenobi, that series coming May 25th, as well as the Andor series, hopefully coming later this year. Cad pulled his helmet off and he says consider this my final lesson look out for yourself anything else is weakness 
But it does him a favor here, because now, with his helmet off, Bobo remembers his time before regaining his armor, and he closes his eyes, meditating like in his flashback does, recalling his past with the Tuscans, the first time he learned that actually, tribe is more important than the individual. And so, he uses his Tuscan gaffy stick to defeat Cad, both physically and in ideology. He stabs Cad. <laughs> Yeah, you'll notice Cad's voice there, actually a product of his chest modulator from his past wounds and the fact that air is directed into his lungs through the back where it would bypass his trachea and his vocal cords. Also, I love this. As his hat comes off, he has a plate on his head. This from the same duel that dented Boba's helmet, a moment that we thought Cad died in. But now it looks like both gunslingers did successfully score some headshots. As Boba walks off, Cad is left in the sand with a red dial blinking on his chest. He seems out for the count, but I don't know. I think that light indicates his survival. Meanwhile, the Rancor rampages, hurling a speeder at them. Concept art actually shows a moment the Rancor was gonna grab that speeder and shake out the passengers. The Rancor climbs the tower, just like King Kong. Mando gives Grogu his old shifter knob that Grogu had twisted off as a toy. That was the one piece that Mando recovered from the Razorcrest wreckage after it was destroyed. And Mando bravely engages the Rancor. The Rancor is pissed and roars, giving us this great moment. I love how they're both freaking out, but look over at Grogu, he doesn't even flinch. He just judges. And so Grogu, unafraid, recalls his defeat of the Mudhorn in the first season, but now takes an even more empathetic path by using the Force to connect with the inner soul of the Raging Beast. As Danny Trejo told us, Rancors are actually quite sensitive. It's so sweet to see Grogu using a less violent means to subdue it, showing how he's really grown beyond his chaotic Force choking past, now as a family foundling seeking to understand. And so Grogu, now spent just as he was after beating the Mudhorn, takes a little nap, nuzzling up against the Rancor, because he too is a sensitive soul, haunted by his past, just trying to set his mind at ease. Pelly quips. I'm guessing there's not gonna be a barbecue. Calling back the random roasted meat she's always cooking, as we saw in The Mandalorian last season. Now back in Mos Eisley, with those Stormtrooper helmets on pikes, Finnick actually makes a new gruesome display out of their successors, slaying each of those gotcha heads and violently hanging mock Shays. Even with his curved Ithorian head, Finnick's lasso seals both mouth orifices cutting off his air. After the battle, the Moss Espa spaceport now shows some happier travelers arriving to this planet. Tourism booming! A contrast from those trouble bringing pikes that we saw arriving here before. As Boba and Fennec tour the recovering streets, his theme music returns. <laughs> It sounds like composer Joseph Shirley now plays it with a pan flute. Almost like this is all just a super friendly Ren fair. Some kids offer him a Maleroon fruit, the fruit from Rebels that the Major Domo crashed into a card of. Boba tosses it to Black Kersantan, who joins them with the mods and that depressed LEP series Ratcatcher droid. Great visual detail here. As the camera rises over the town, we cross dissolve into the curvature of Tatooine in space, but leaving us with a few frames of superimposition, making it look like a rainbow of peace stretching over the town. Because as this book of Boba Fett draws to a close, we get a biblical illusion of God's covenant with Noah after the flood. Grogu rides in the enclosed astromech port of the M1 Starfighter, tapping that shifter knob to beg Mando to hit that sublight thruster. I love how his breath fogs the canopy. Just a little detail they added, either practically from under the puppet or more likely with VFX, just to make Grogu look more like a bored kid on a road trip breathing against the car window. And framing Grogu in that jump seat directly over Mando's head is just a perfect way to leave these two. Grogu, positioned at the top of Mando's mind like a guardian angel protecting him, but also the best idea light bulb this gunslinger has ever had. You probably got how this episode, the credits play the Boba Fett theme music. And yeah, the vocalists are now singing the theme with the words Boba and Fett. Bo, 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 fat, fat, fat. What a goofy acapella group they are. Now the post credit scene reveals the new occupant of Boba's back to tank, <gasps> Cobb Banff, wearing a turtleneck. I mean, none of us assume this guy was dead since we all saw him get shot in the shoulder. But also returning is bass guitarist Thundercat as that mod artist, heat rising from his instruments to give Cobb the old Fennec treatment. But I think the most important detail is what is not in the shot. Because throughout this series, we've always come back to see Boba in this tank, with his Boba Fett armor rested off to the side. But now, the armor is 
is not here and neither is Boba. Cobb was the only other person we've seen in these series to wear Boba's armor, but he gave it up, a detail that Cad Bane repeatedly pointed out. And now that armor is back where it belongs and Boba no longer needs this bath because now, finally, his inner scars have healed. I want to thank you all so much for joining me for these breakdowns. I mean, these seven episodes had some real high highs. It just was always a delight to dive deep into them each week with you guys. Now, I'm going to be doing this a lot more when Obi-Wan Kenobi comes to Disney Plus May 25th. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at EA Voss. Follow New Rockstars. Subscribe to New Rockstars for more analysis of everything you love. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye!